Now, because we uh, were not in this last week, I'm going to review just a little, but don't get nervous. Tell your neighbor, don't get nervous in the service. <laughs> so let's pick up tonight at Colossians 1.13. For he has rescued us. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So don't ever worry about having faith again. Just act like it is all so, and it will be so for you. It all belongs to you. You don't have to think about your worthiness. We're not counting on our worthiness. We're counting on his worthiness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And don't think about your ability. We're not counting on our ability. We're counting on his ability. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so the, the whole task before you is to be bold and to walk in the fullness of his marvelous grace. I have never one time been chastised by the Lord for believing for too much. Never one time. I have never one time been chastised by the Lord for exercising spiritual authority. Not one time. So in other words, every time I reach out there a little further, he meets me there. And he doesn't chastise me. I think people think that uh, you can go too far in faith, you know, that you can hurt yourself. <laughs> Believing God. It's funny to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So enjoy your rights. <clears throat> Take your place and fill his heart with joy. Ephesians 2, 6, and God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him, with the Father in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So... We're masters, we're overcomers, we're winners and victors in Christ. We rule and reign with Christ. So there's no try to it. I don't mean to quote Yoda, but you know, uh, do or do not, there is no try. And we left off last time talking about how circumstances ought to drive us to God and be smart enough to not allow circumstances to drive us away from God. We left off last time talking about how that these principalities and powers have all been conquered and how you are eternally free. Principalities and powers are eternally defeated, whipped, stripped of their authority and conquered. You get your liberty by remembering these truths and then acting accordingly. You simply refuse to stay in bondage. Satan knows he is whipped, but he doesn't want you to know it. Kind of reminds me of 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, there's truth out there, but they don't want you to know it. Right. You know, and so they, they, in the cancel culture, if somebody posts something that's true, they'll, they'll cancel them or suspend them or take their account or put a warning on it. Uh, you know, if something's not true, it'll be proven to not be true over time. But... If something's true, why, who's worried about something that's true? Well, people with nefarious motives. And uh, that's why we face it all the time. Um, we had a young man years ago. This is a sad story. We had a young man years ago, and I won him to the Lord. And the woman he was living with, I won him to the Lord. And uh, he told me that he had... Uh, been with countless women, lived with women, uh, you know, party culture, had a cocaine habit. I think if I remember right, it was $50,000 a year. And this is 30 years ago. And, uh, but his mother never chastised him about the women, never chastised him about the party, and never chastised him about the alcohol, never chastised him about the cocaine. But when he got saved... And started coming to church when the doors were open and started tithing. It was the tithing that really set her off. She just was beside herself in criticism. It's amazing to me. You would think you'd be happy that you're, oh, and then, you know, they got married, I married them. I mean, you'd, be, you'd, you'd think you'd be happy, right? A mom would be happy, right? That the son would get off alcohol, get off drugs, stop partying, settle down. They used to say in the old days, 
you know, get married. Oh, no, no, no. So we have faced it all these years. Um, see, nobody minds you going to a dead place. Nobody minds you going to a powerless place. So Satan knows he's whipped, but he doesn't want you to know about it. See, that's what it's about. Satan knows he's whipped, but he doesn't want you to know about it. It's like this drug, you know, they didn't want anybody to know about, but over 100 members of Congress took it. But it doesn't work. And they don't want you to know about it. But over 100 members of Congress took it. Why? For grins. You know what I'm saying? Because it doesn't work. That's kind of what we're dealing with spiritually. Satan doesn't want you to know about it. Because, see, once you know about it, then you enforce it. And Satan has to stop pushing. He, he can try and push you around, but he won't succeed. Amen. He wants to keep you in ignorance. I didn't say stupidity. I'm, I'm ignorant of a lot of things. I'm ignorant, for example, of nuclear physics, but I'm not a stupid person. I just never studied that. I don't care about it. But the point is, uh, a lot of people are ignorant of stuff that's important. Do you understand? And, uh, you know, some of what you don't know will kill you, obviously. So there's certain areas of life where we don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want to be pushed around by the devil. We don't want to be ignorant of what the Word of God says belongs to us. Revelation 12, 1 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Lady came to me within the last fortnight, and she seems very earnest. She seems very studious. She's got a notebook. She's writing down scriptures. And she said, now, if I'm doing this and this and this, but it doesn't, I don't seem to be getting traction, what, what's the first thing you would evaluate? I said, your, I said, no offense. I said, don't get mad at me. I said, your mouth. And then I told her, you know, where to go on the app because I told her, I said, a lot of people think that their faith guides their confession. I said, actually, it's the opposite. Your confession guides your faith. In one of the cars, Kenneth Hagin was just saying the other day that if you repeat the word of God long enough, you'll get to believing it. Amen. Faith, and faith cometh by hearing. I heard that also in a Fred Price message in one of the cars. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. See, the words in the Bible are the exact same words that might be in a newspaper or a magazine. So there's nothing special about the words, but the, they were organized by God. The order of the words, and that's what gives them power. So when... When we hear the word of God preached, and that's why, that's why David Wilkerson was exactly spot on. He was exactly right. He was criticized. Uh, but when he wrote the book, for example, Set the Trumpet to Thy Mouth, you can hardly find it. It's very expensive if you find one. Uh, but they changed the music. Now, some of that was good. We went over this yesterday in staff meeting. See, when, when I came up, when I grew up, it was all hymns. And a lot of it's full of unbelief. I don't remember all the words. I don't remember the title of the song. But one of them is, Pass me not, O by, O gentle Savior. Well, that's just chock full of unbelief and it's unscriptural because the Holy Spirit is everywhere at all times. So how can he pass you by? And then Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So how can he pass me by? Do you understand? Yeah. So a lot of those scriptures are just chock full of unbelief, but they were traditional. And then the Jesus movement came along. And in the Jesus movement, which we were not really a part of, but we, we were around it. Uh, scripture courses began to be written. And, and uh, I can see it like it was yesterday. Standing out in Lindale, Texas, it's gone now, Agape Forest Ranch, they would take hardened young people 
and not just get them off drugs, but they would have them do manual labor. It was a ranch. They'd have them do manual labor. I, I, can, I can see it like it was yesterday, standing there by a split rail fence, and I'm talking to Keith Green and uh, Barry McGuire, Eve of Destruction, and uh, Winky Prattney, preacher out of New Zealand. And, uh, but that was the Jesus movement. And that was great. And not, not all of those songs, well, not all of them are so great because of the musical arrangement, but they're scripture courses. Well, how can you go wrong with scripture? And then the, the whole idea of cool, let's be cool, let's do stuff cool. And so then it kind of just all wandered off. You know, I'm, I'm standing here in my own church, I don't know, 10 years back, and we're singing something about oceans rising, and I thought, what the hell am I listening to <laughs> in my own church? And then I got, back, I got back involved in music because, in other words, cool, I like cool, but I don't like error. Amen. You know, I like a catchy tune, but I don't like error. Hell is a Bible word, by the way. Jesus talked about hell three times as often as he spoke of heaven. But my point is, what we hear guides our lives. Your life sitting here tonight is absolutely the result of who and what you have chosen to listen to heretofore. And the way you change your life is by changing your hearing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it doesn't all have to be Bible or scripture. I mean, somebody that marked me very early was Zig Ziglar, Zig Ziglar tapes. Man, I listened to Zig Ziglar tapes going to and from selling cookware. Sue and I got married. We'd go to seminars in Dallas, uh, pay, the, pay the price, go over there, and it would be Ira Hayes and Robert Schuler and Zig Ziglar and others. And then there was a season, what a sweet spot that was, where Zig Ziglar would sell tickets and you went over to San Francisco Steakhouse in Dallas and you had lunch and then he would speak. And that was just fabulous. Those days are gone forever. Last time I saw Zig Ziglar, he was, Sue and I were sitting in the waiting room at the Cooper Clinic and he was there, he was retired. And uh, what a great guy. He was bragging about his chauffeur, chauffeuress, was his granddaughter, tall, red-headed gal. And uh, he just thought that was so great, you know, that she worked for the organization and she was his chauffeur. So it's not just Bible, and it doesn't have to be specifically Scripture, but what we listen to. Are you listening to positive stuff? Are you listening to uplifting stuff? Are you listening to stuff that builds you up and doesn't tear you down? Are you listening to stuff that gives you hope and builds faith in you, or are you listening to stuff that tears you down? Amen. See, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, but the point is, Satan wants, oh, I was talking about these trends in churches, and so along with that trend of cool music was the trend of less word in the messages. And... Uh, I'm not going to criticize him by name, but, you know, one of the most popular people in the pulpits of America, he'll never tell you the reference. See, I want to know the reference. Because, number what if I want to look it up later? What if I want to make a note in the back of my Bible? What if, what if that scripture really impacts me and I want to make a note of it? Well, because apparently they do surveys. And they do surveys, and they've discovered in these surveys, people don't like... You know what they don't like. They don't like offerings, and they don't like the Bible. Well, why the heck would I gear my church to goats? Amen. See, my job is not to make goats happy. My job is to preach the gospel and win people to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and make them sheep in God's pasture. You understand? Not to make goats happy. Amen. So then these churches, and you read about some of this stuff, and I don't want to get into that, but you think, how could this go on? Well, they got a church full of goats. And then who's doing all this? Well, compromised ministers. Well, 
are they even born again? I don't even want to go down that road. That's above my pay grade. But the point is, it's about the word. It's about the word. And so we left off two weeks ago. I'm not going to read it again, but in Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus after his 40-day fast. And the way he got rid of the devil was he quoted the word to the devil, and he quoted the word to the devil. It took three times. But what if someone never attended a church like Faith Christian Center where they're taught their rights in Christ? Well, they wouldn't know what to do. What if someone never attended a church like Faith Christian Center and they don't know you can command Satan to leave your presence? If you're here tonight and you have a besetting sin, that's a King James term. Some terms in the King James just can't be beat. So if you're here tonight and you have a besetting sin, it's not that complicated. Whenever that besetting sin comes to your mind, these are probably typically maybe always habits. When that besetting sin comes to your mind, and then on top of that, every morning, every morning without fail, but on top of that, every time it comes to mind, you say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I rebuke this foul, tormenting spirit of, and you name the sin, and I commanded to leave my presence and to never return. And you'll be shocked. I mean, you could have had a problem with something for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, 50 years, and it, it'll just melt away. Now, initially, it won't just go away and stay away. So you'll have to work it every morning without fail, 365 days. And then every time that comes to you to do that, you say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I speak to that foul, tormenting spirit of, and name it, and I command it to leave my presence and to never return. Now, I don't want to misrepresent something. It's not one and done. Because even in the story of Jesus, and we were in Matthew 4, it says he left him for a more opportune time. So if, if, if the Bible says that Satan left Jesus for a more, until a more opportune time, we would be silly to assume that he's going to leave us alone forever. He's going to wait for a more opportune time. And uh, a lot of times, the more opportune time is when you're blue. So the <laughs> it sounds so ridiculously simple, but... Jo and one of the pr pr primary jobs is don't get blue. Right. How do you not get blue? Well, be in church when the doors are open. Amen. And, and then, you know, I love B.B. King. I really like B.B. King, but I never listen to that stuff. Because, uh, you know, in country western music, oh my gosh. You know, my wife left me and somebody killed my dog and all of that. I, I, I just cannot, I cannot stay up if I don't guard my listening. Amen. So Satan, Satan, his more opportune time is going to be typically when you know, maybe you're not in the perfect frame of mind. And then, you know, Satan uses people. It's not like the exorcist movies, not exorcist, uh, what was that Gregory Peck movie with the dogs? Uh, it's not like that. Satan doesn't need dogs because he has people. Satan doesn't need snakes because he has people. Do you understand? And uh, so there's always willing instruments of Satan. And so you just have to guard yourself to keep those voices at bay. Now, I realize when you work somewhere, it's, it's tougher. But you know, there's no law against believing God for a better job. There's no rule against believing God to start your own company. Amen. So Jesus cast out demons with words. Jesus healed the sick with words. Jesus hushed the sea with words. I mean, just look at the damage uh, Dr. Fraudster did in the last two years with words. And nearly everything the guy said has been proven to be false, if anybody's actually reading and thinking critically. Jesus gave us the ability to use words, his words, and his own name that has all authority in heaven and on earth. 
Now, I realize I'm reluctant to use examples because people will think I'm crazy. Uh, but I went round and round and round with crows. It's, it's uh, I don't know what it is about crows, but they just make so much noise. And so I went round and round and round with how to effectively deal with crows when I'm out praying. And I'm not going to go through all that. But I came to a place where it just seemed to be a lot of trouble to command them to leave and stay away. So what I did, I just shifted gears and I commanded them to be quiet. And just this morning, just this morning, I walked back, I walked past some great big honking crow. You know, in Texas, these things are as big as chickens. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's there in a tree watching me walk by and pray, but he, he, he didn't make a noise. He didn't make any noise. Now, I know people think, oh man, he's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, a guy that works a guy that works for me told somebody else when I when I came out he was already out there working. I came out. He had somebody with him. He said, "Watch." He said, "The crows will stop making noise." And I just came out and started praying. And I don't even have to do it now. I guess I've told him to shut up often enough. <laughs> it's become permanent. I went through a real process with that. I don't, mind, I don't mind some noises, but something about crows, it's almost like they're mocking you. And uh, we have authority. But how would you know if you have authority if you never exercised it? You can, you can, you can speak to your body. You know, he told me many years ago, I had some challenges in my life, and I don't want to get into it, but I had some challenges in my life because of the way my parents did me. And uh, they really did me wrong in 1989. And I had some challenges. And the Lord, in prayer one day, the Lord spoke to me and he said, speak to it. I said, speak to it how? And he said, when, when those thoughts come to you and those emotions well up in you, he said, just, just speak to yourself and say, peace, be still. And I thought, well, that's Bible. And, and I did. So then what was very emotional became academic. In other words, yeah, I, I fully remember it, but it's not emotional. Do you understand? Because I learned to speak to myself, peace, be still. Amen. And, and you understand too, that when we get worked up, we get angry, chemicals get released into us that are very harmful. You know, I can feel it in my life when something provokes me to anger. I mean, I can literally feel my body dumping chemicals into my system that I, it's almost like somebody put three drops of acid in my veins. It can't be good for you. And so, you know, I've learned this over time. Peace. Be still. And the way people drive today in 2022, this is really helpful information. Amen. You know, peace, be still. So don't just be a hearer of the word and don't be like some who forget what manner of man they are in Christ. James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word... We always, we always zero in at Faith Christian Center on verse 22. Here we're going to zero in on verse, verses 23 and 24. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And I've always thought that verses 23 and 24 were kind of blind to us out of the NIV. In the King James, verse 24 says, For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. Now that's odd that in the King James it's a little clearer. And then in the Weymouth translation, verse 24 says, although he has looked carefully at himself, he goes away and, and has immediately forgotten the sort of man he is. Satan is, uh, you know, Satan's like a bad wife. He's constantly rehearsing your faults. 
And the man who does not do the word of God, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, switching to King James. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was or is. We forget who we are. We forget who we are. We do it all the time. Somebody tells you about their marriage trouble. We forget who we are. Somebody tells you about how they're sick and they need a surgery. We forget who we are. Somebody tells us about their drug problem. We forget who we are. See? And so that's why we have to be doers of the Word of God. A doer of the Word of God, the more you do the Word of God, I think it was 2018 Holy Week Revival, Thursday, Friday night. We talked about how to train the human spirit. The way you train the human spirit is by taking action on the Word of God. It's like lifting weights. You get stronger. The more you lift weights, the more, the, the more the, they call it strength training. They don't call it weakness training. They call it strength training. And the same thing with doing the Word of God, the more you take action on the Word of God. And now the whole thing is geared toward, and I understand it. You understand, you understand I'm a smart guy, and I understand it, but I'm not submitting to it. Because now the whole game is to tell people it doesn't matter what they do. Name one area of life where doing nothing improves your life. You can't. And the same genius architect designed everything. I want to lose weight. Well, now there, doing nothing might work. You know, if we change you, if we put handcuffed you to a radiator and didn't feed you, now doing nothing might work. But that's not how, it, that's, that's maybe the only example of doing nothing working. But even in losing weight, well, I got to do something. I got to, I got to get a calorie counter. I've got to exercise more. I've got to do something. I've got to take action. But the cool thing now in cool churches is to tell people it doesn't matter what you do. God blesses us all the same regardless of what we do. And this is, this, this is, this is not just wrong. It ruins lives. This is not just wrong. This ruins lives. Because it doesn't matter what area of life we're talking about. You have to take action. You have to do something. You know, I have guys come to me and uh, they say they're ready to get married. And I ask them, well, how many dates have you been on? None. I had a gal, there was a gal came and met Pastor Sue in the cafe. This was so long ago, nobody knows who we're talking about. And she said, I'm ready to get married now. It's a heartbreak. It's a heartbreak. It's a heartbreak. And, and Sue, you know, Sue's a loving gal. She's very, very polite. And, if, you know, this is why they don't let me anywhere near this stuff, because I'd be saying, uh, have you looked in a mirror? <laughs> but, you know, Sue, sweetheart Sue, she asked her if she knew how to cook. No. And I realized in 2022, uh, women think that a man doesn't need cooking. Why do you need cooking? There's McDonald's right over here. <laughs> See? Skills. These are life skills that right. apparently nobody's teaching anybody anymore. I mean, probably... It'd be interesting to do a survey in the youth group. How many know how to change a tire? You know? Life skills are not being taught. And that all has to do with what? Doing. My son-in-law always amazes me. Because, you know, my first thought on everything is, well, you know, get it done. Hire it, get it done. Oh, no, I can do that myself. It's amazing. It's amazing what he can do. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I know some of that. I just don't want to be bothered with it. 
<laughs> but I mean, he actually does stuff. You know, rebuilt the porch on his, the back of their house because some of the timbers had rotted over time. And my thought was, you know, yeah, you know, people, you know, you can hire that done. Yeah, but I can say I'll do it myself. But life skills. Okay, so the same generation that has not been taught life skills, when they come to a church and we're we're teaching success skills. Yes. Well, I don't want to hear that. See, in other words, it's Bernie Sanders Christianity. And just on the way over here, it's a great message. I think it's from 1992, Winter Bible Seminar, Kenneth Hagin, Days of Heaven Upon the Earth. That was the message that got a hold of us. That's the night. That's the night. We wrote that check for $2,500. We're sitting there in the restaurant of the Marriott in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> And in walked John and Dodie Osteen, in walked Aretha Hagen, and then by and by in walked Kenneth Hagen. And Sue looked at me, and I looked at her. I said, go ahead. We had never been taught this. We had never been taught this. We had never even heard of this. And she got out the checkbook, and there was a lot of money for us back in those days. That was 1992. She wrote out a check, Kenneth and Aretha Hagen, for $2,500. A watershed event of our lives. Within a year and a half, we were millionaires. Amen. Back when a million dollars was more than what it, I mean, now it takes a million dollars, you know, to buy a track house. But I mean, you know, in 1993, in 1993, a million dollars was some money. Oh, but in that message, he said, it just flew out of my head, but it'll come back to me. What were we talking about? Doing something. Pardon? Days of heaven upon the earth. It'll come back to me. See right there? That's what you say to yourself. You don't talk about how you have some timers. Right. <laughs> say it'll come back to me. And it does, amen? Amen. Because I got distracted in my thought process on the watershed of an event of our lives. That changed our lives. Amen. And now we're living in what he was preaching about that night. Amen. Just driving over here. It'll come back to me. Let's press on. And the beautiful thing about technology is if it doesn't come back to me, I can listen to it again. <laughs> Amen. See, listening. What are you listening to? Amen. See, is it building you up or is it tearing you down? Faith cometh by hearing Amen. and hearing by the word of God. Amen. 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 So forgetteth what manner of man he is. And we do this. We forget who we are. You know, there was a season in my life for many years, I was driving a five series BMW and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, I was out of the country preaching. You can't relate to it now. You came later. But there was a season in my life, nine, ten months a year, I'd preach overseas, do crusades. There were weeks I won 100,000 people to the, to the Lord in a week. We did it all the time. As my responsibilities grew, you know, then that, Schedule changed. And then you get to a blessed place in life where you're speaking to bigger crowds. If you're speaking to bigger crowds, you don't have to go as often. And then we were giving money away, which, you know, has to be raised. It just doesn't show up. So uh, most of you came, came after all of that. But we forget who we are. I was sitting in T.L. Osborne's living room one day and he thought it was cute. John Osteen was headed to India to preach and he was worried about it. 
And so he asked T.L. to send him a bunch of tapes so he could sharpen himself up before he went to India. We're all the same. Satan will come along and tell us, he'll remind us about our faults. He'll, he'll tell us what we haven't done, what we haven't accomplished. But he's a liar. Amen. Say it again, I can do all things, do all through, things Christ through Christ who strengthens me. Strengthens me. Yeah. The Lord is marvelous. He'll, he empowers us to do what is impossible. So people forget who they are. This new creation man, unless he's made a careful study of what he is in Christ, in the time of stress or crisis, will forget what manner of man he is. <laughs> we handled the meltdown. But I didn't handle the meltdown as well as I did the COVID panic. I freely admit it. And I'm not sure why that is. I think I'm older now and I'm studying all the time and I'm praying all the time. I know more than I did. And maybe also, well, it was stressful. We had just moved in here just in time for a recession. But I know more now. That's why you got to keep studying. That's why you, you got to apply your heart to wisdom. Amen. That's why you have to attend to his word. See, this new creation, man, unless he's made a careful study of what he is in Christ in the time of stress or crisis, will forget what manner of man he is. You have no idea how blessed you are. Because I set the pattern. Chad Smith said, I held the line. And we were not diminished by the COVID panic. We were protected physically. We were protected financially. And we progressed financially. Amen. See, I know more than I did now. So what about these poor preachers that have believed this thing of, see, you, you do understand, right, if you don't have any word in your sermons, well, you don't need to study the word during the week. We've lived so long in the realm of the senses that it's difficult for many of us to realize what we are in Christ. T.L. Osborne told me one day in his living room, he said, everybody thinks... No, that was at lunch. He said, everybody thinks we spend our lives trying to talk people into believing God. He said, believing God is the easy part. He said, we spend our lives trying to talk people into believing in themselves. To venture out. And all of these things going on in 2022 in church work are snipe hunts. The whole BLM thing, social justice, these are all snipe hunts. 100,000 years from tonight, none of that will matter. The only thing that's going to matter, a hundred year, uh, uh, forget about that, 100 years from tonight, the only thing that's going to matter is are you with God in heaven? Are your children with God in heaven? And what did you do for the Lord in this life? That's all this, nothing else will matter. The car you drove up, in, uh, drove up in tonight won't matter. The house you go home tonight won't matter. The clothes you wore tonight won't matter. Or you vacation this year won't matter. None of it will matter. A hundred years from tonight, the only thing that will matter is, are, your children, are you in eternity with God? Are your children in eternity with God? And what did you do for the Lord right here? Because that's the basis upon which you will be rewarded. The, Jesus himself said, we will be rewarded for what we have done in the body. Okay, so if Jesus himself says, we'll be rewarded for what we have done in the body, why are these preachers saying it doesn't matter what you do? Right. You see how they're sabotaging people. That's right. they're sabot and the beautiful thing is, and, and here at Faith Christian Center, man, I just preached the whole enchilada because Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And people don't seem to understand this. You, you can have it all. You can have it all. You can have a great life. You can have a great marriage. You can have great kids. You can live... You can, you can eat the best of the land, drive the best of the land, wear the best of the land, vacation in the best of the land. You can do it all here while you're racking up reward in heaven because you generate more than you need if you'll just work the plan that we described this past Sunday. You can generate more than you need. Jesus himself said, when he said don't store up where moth corrupts, rust corrupts and moth destroys, he wasn't saying don't save money. He was just saying 
Don't make that your singular ambition, your singular to-do list, because he talked about sending up treasure ahead of us, sending up treasure in heaven. Why would he talk about sending up treasure in heaven if there weren't any treasure in heaven? Talk to me. Why would, and why would he talk about sending up if what you did didn't matter? So we teach and preach here, man, you can have it all. I mean, you can, have, you can have a great family. You can have children that are self-sufficient. Praise God for self-sufficient children. Amen. And, uh, and you, you can eat the best of the land, drink the best of the land. When I say that, I'm talking about, you know, illy coffee versus, you know, whatever nasty stuff. Uh, I'm not talking about Jack Daniels and all that. You know, eat the best of the land, wear the best of the land, drive the best of the land. Wow, you're racking up treasure in heaven. Amen. That's what we believe. That's what we, that's what we, that's what we live out. Amen. 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 But it's all based on being a doer of the word of God. Amen. And I can do all things. To... <laughs> See, you don't know it, but I'm living right where I'm teaching you. You don't know that, but I am. You know, I'm perfectly content. I'm only months from not owing anybody anything. And here at church, we, we don't owe anybody anything. So I'm content. I don't care if you meet in the gym. What difference does that make to me? Not unless I fill it three times, then I got to do something. But the men of the church want me to do phase two. Then I find out what it costs to build a church in 2022 because of all this money printing. And unlike the, the guy that's being managed by the Easter Bunny, uh, I don't have a printing press. You see what I'm saying? But I can't think about it. No point, no point in stressing. I just say I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And I know the way it works. God, God, will, God will make men rich to uh, the ones that are willing. Rich. Because we're talking about money now. We're talking about <laughs> we're talking about we're talking about $20 million before you spit. I mean, before you even do anything special, just based on square footage. Yeah, so we can't, we can't do that killing chickens. <laughs> See, we might, we might put a barn out here having a... What do they call those where they kill chickens and they barbecue them and... See, I'm so out of that world. I don't even know what they call that. Garage sale. We can't, we can't, how many of you understand? We can't build a $20 million building doing a garage sale. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, talk, I'm saying this is like go-to-work money. This is like go-to-work level. You know what I'm saying? Put the old man back to work. This is what we're talking about. Amen. Amen. So I'm living where I'm teaching you. I can say it again. I can do all things, do all through, things Christ, through Christ who gives me the strength. Me the strength. And, and I heard a man say, Sunday, these are just numbers. Right. And God's not afraid of a number. Right? right? right. God's not afraid of a number. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but this is where we're going to go for the Father's Day guys night out. And this is where we're going to go on Sunday mornings because a young man told me just this, just yesterday, that he'd crossed a million dollars in net worth. And I said, well, you, you feel like you're wealthy? And he said, no. I said, of course not, because it's not worth what it was. It's not worth what it was. So when you stand still, you're going backwards. And all of my life, I've had God's people act like, well, you know, this is enough. No, it's not. I'll move out to the country. Yeah, and they are going to tax the you-know-what out of you. 
In other words, because the, the, uh, the expenses are not standing still. And because the expenses are not standing still, you can't stand still. So we cannot be like this new creation man who in the time of stress or crisis forgets what manner of man he is. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm really proud of this congregation because I could have done the exact same thing in 2020. I did in most churches and they would have nailed me to a cross or run me out or I don't know what they would have done. But uh, this congregation, when Chad Smith says, I held the line, this congregation held the line with me. And we didn't lose anybody. Amen. But it took guts. Amen. See, what did it take? It took faith Amen. to not forget who we were. Amen. Faith in God. Faith in God. Yeah. He's, he's a sweetheart. I'm stomping around out there in 1985. We had bought that land. And I'm stomping around out there. It was a real chore because the dew would be on the grass and your shoes get wet and then, it, you know, it can be muddy. And so there used to be, there was a ridge on the, uh, the highway department land. It was just a little higher than the, land, the three and a quarter acres we owned up there. And so you understand when you pray at five o'clock in the morning, there's days where you got a lot of people, but then there's days where nobody's there. And when nobody was there, I didn't feel the need to like walk a circle or something. I just walked that ridge back and forth. And I'd walk to the highway. I'd walk up that, I'd walk that ridge to the east to the school property line. I'd turn around, I'd walk back to the west, and I walked to the school line east. I turned, and there were three men walking. And I casually moved toward them, cautiously, and when they got to me, the Lord Jesus Christ, he motioned over his left shoulder. He said, this is nothing. He said, you'll build this. This is nothing. He said, there'll be more for you to build later. But then he said, teach my people faith. Amen. And so I, I don't have any other job Amen. but to teach his people faith. Amen. And every day that the Lord tarries, more faith of, is required of us Amen. than the day before. Amen. Because this world is more insane every day. When I see what they're doing right now in Shanghai and how Bill Gates brags about how they're doing it right, it is so alarming. So we cannot afford to forget what manner of man we are. And we cannot afford, we cannot afford for fear to lay a hold of our hearts. Amen. And now we have seen the game and we have seen the agenda. So we know how they're coming. If you had asked me five years ago, if somebody had said to me five years ago, they're going to they're gonna manufacture a medical crisis and they're going to use that medical crisis to introduce IDs and limit people's ability to leave their homes or buy or sell, I, I would have said, I, I don't see how that could happen. But they used something I never would have seen. And here we, but now we know the game. Now we know what it's about. That's right. Amen. And they have assured us that when they gave everybody those gene therapy shots, they did not, and when they did the test, they did not collect DNA. Do we believe that? So we can see where this is all headed, a digital ID, DNA, medical history. And if you don't comply, I'm talking about during the tri tribulation, if you don't comply, 
you won't be able to buy or sell. So out of, out of all the days of my life, the, the day to not be complacent and the day to not forget who you are in Christ and the day to not forget what manner of man and what manner of woman God has made you, this is the day. Austin says about me that I'm a first-generation Christian, so I, I have bark on me. You know, he's so nice. <laughs> T.L. Osborne said, you know, Austin's the best of me and Sue. He's so nice. But see, I'm first-generation Christian. I got bark on me. And I went to the Lord about that many years ago, and he, he showed me that he needed some men with bark Amen. at the end. And here we are. So, all of these things they got going on, our snipe hunts, we are to be about our Father's business. Amen. And we're to be winning people to Jesus, and we're to be casting out devils, and we're to be praying for people that are bound by drugs or porn or alcohol or whatever their issue is, and we're to be laying hands on the sick politely when they request it. You know what I'm saying? You can't lay hands on people even Paul said, don't lay hands on people suddenly. But there's so much that we, the people of God, are into. There's so much the church is into that doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. Now, we live in two worlds simultaneously. We got we to gotta live ready to go tonight. But on the other hand, we have to live as though he will not come back in our lifetime. So we got to save money and get stuff paid off and be free financially. But in the midst of doing all of that activity, we can never forget who we are. We are the children of God. We are ambassadors for Christ. And we carry the greatest message that any man who ever lived carried we carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's no, glory, there's no more glorious message. There's no, no greater truth that could be shared. And it's our privilege to serve him in these days. It's a privilege. Because he obviously needed strength at the end. And he chose us. And we're going to be strong Amen. in the Lord Amen. and in the power of his might. Amen. And we're going to do his work. Amen. And we're going to be blessed in the meantime at everything we put our hand to. Amen. And consider this, and with this I'm going to quit. He doesn't have that many. It's not like it was. How many does he have? that are committed to his word, committed to the basics, committed to the gospel, committed to living right, committed to winning people to Jesus. Churches don't even do altar calls anymore. Committed. How many does he have left? And so you could hardly go to Houston. I loved it. You could hardly go to Houston without John Osteen saying, the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the earth, looking whom he, for whom he might bless. Amen. And so when he's looking across the earth, and he's looking, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find what on the earth? Amen. Cool music. Will he find cool music on the earth? <laughs> when the Son of Man returns, will he find Bible-less sermons on the earth? Is that what he said? Yeah. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Sometimes I'm out there in the morning and I just tell them, thank you, Father God. I'm a believer. Amen. I'm not a doubter. Why don't you shout that out loud five times? Thank you, Father God. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. Thank you, Father God. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. Thank you, Father God. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. Thank you, Father God. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. Thank you, Father God. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter.